Hey again, everyone. It's Mike. Mike Yow. Making another video. So, um, this is almost a daily thing now. Every other day. Um, not a lot of people are watching these, but, you know, I keep saying that because I want more people to check out the content. Um, I'm sharing 40 years of game mastering experience here, by golly. So, today's topic, I thought I would do the top five GM prep tips, even before the first die is cast. That's a really long title. I may shorten it, although, I don't know, kind of weirdly like it. So, I just thought I'd do my top five game master, dungeon master, prep tips, even before the first die is cast. Literally what I just said. Meaning that these are the things I would do and I would suggest other people doing. But, you know, everybody's different. But these are my suggestions based on experience as such. Um, top five things to do before, meaning that before the first die is cast or rolled, is before you start playing. Now, if you use a character, uh, random character generation methodology, like old school AD&D, uh, then that's not necessarily true because you'd be rolling dice to create ability scores. But anyway... In most systems, particularly uh, even in D&D 5th edition, you, if you choose the basic um, character creation, ability score, assignment, stuff, point by, etc., um, or standard array, then you're not rolling dice. Uh, so literally everything is built. If you're running Savage Kingdoms, <clears throat> there you go. Got my, one of my many t-shirts on. It has it, the logo on there. Um, if you're running Savage Kingdoms, that's even more true that because uh, there's no random character creation. It's all you craft the character the way you want to. Um, but, and this will work for any other system. Traveler, Deadlands, Savage Worlds, uh, Numenaria. I, I don't want to list them all because there are literally thousands of RPGs out there. Uh, only a hundred of which I've probably even uh, tried. Um, so yeah, this will really apply to pretty much any system. So I'll try to make this fairly agnostic, system agnostic. So number one, number one tip, get organized. Um, and some of these are going to seem like common sense, but I, hopefully I'll delve a little deeper into it. So get, get organized, meaning that more in specific, make sure you have your materials, your books, your dice. Again, it seems obvious, uh, but I've seen new DMs, even experienced game masters sit at the table and they're kind of scrounging around. They're like, oh man, I forgot my book today or my PDF. Or I've... Yeah, and it happens to us all. We're human. We forget stuff all the time. I mean, I even showed up once at a convention and like some ma major thing I thought I had packed in my bags wasn't there. Uh, it was fine because uh, most of it was in my noggin. Anyway, um, but yeah, it happens to the best of us. But if you can, be organized. Make sure you have all your materials, meaning that if you're running a module, make sure you have that printed out. Or if it's good old, old school, already hard copy, make sure you have that laid out. Maybe make sure you have certain things highlighted if you want, if you're running that style of game, uh, you know, a module game or a published adventure. So highlight certain things, print out things if you need it uh, to shortcut yourself. So you may want to lay the module out, you know, in your standard sort of book format. But, you know, if you need sidebars printed out, then do so. Kind of have them to the side. You can shortcut them onto note cards. I've, I've used 5 by 7 note index cards for a long time uh, as non-player character stats or as uh, initiative trackers or any kind of game notes, uh, major NPCs that come into play etc. Uh, even a calendar uh, of the of uh, when I kept a little more detailed track of, of, of time in the overall campaign. I would you know I had this the calendar on there and it was really cool actually I may go back to something like that. Um, so yeah get organized make sure you have uh, all the dice you need make sure your players have the dice. Um, and again this is really before the first session but just kind of make sure everybody's taken care of uh, particularly yourself as the game master because you are it is collective storytelling, as we all know, but you're still you're still the director, you're still the stage manager, you're you're the you're the main guy. Um, yeah. So also with get organized, I would say um, make sure you're up to par on the characters, meaning the player characters, but also non-player characters, the setting, etc. So meaning uh, up to par. What does that mean? Well, it means so make sure you're familiar with who who is playing what, what your care, what your players are, uh, at least thinking about playing. Um, 
And that, and that goes into a session zero, which I'll get to in just a second. So make sure you're kind of on, on par of what the character, what you expect. Uh, maybe even lay out if you want uh, some particular classes or callings, to use a Savage Kingdoms term, um, to not be played or certain races or uh, cultures or whatever not to be played. Then, you know, let that be known. Um you know, hey guys, we're going to run a game with all elves or all dwarves, or I only want one dragonborn uh, in the party, or whatever. So, uh, because, you know, you as a game master, you may have a particular style of game on, on hand, and hopefully the players will buy into that. And I'll get to that in just a second. Um, be up to par on the setting, the setting you're running. So, if you're running, say, Dungeons and Dragons, um, and you, you're going to put it in the sort of the default setting of Forgotten Realms. Make sure you're up to speed on Forgotten Realms. Make sure you, you read some. If you haven't read some of the novels, um, make sure you you read the campaign books that have been put out. Um, there's a lot of stuff online as, as well. Check the internet. Internet is your friend if you use it wisely and correctly. And don't go down rabbit holes and stay focused like YouTube. Um, you'll find lots of uh, stuff there about Faerun and Forgotten Realms, etc. Uh, or whatever. Or if you're running Greyhawk, uh, old school, you know, let's go old school, Gary Gygax's original setting. Uh, there's materials about that. It's, there's not quite as much out there um, because it's not the default setting anymore. But back in the old days, it, it actually kind of was the default setting before uh, Ed Greenwood's Forgotten Realms. So, but you can find plenty of stuff on the internet if you're running Greyhawk, if you're running Dark Sun, uh, probably my favorite campaign setting of Dungeons and Dragons by far because it's Sword and Sorcery and it's kind of gritty. Um, yeah, research that. So make sure you know the setting, whatever it is. Um, um, that's that's important because you are the mirror to the world. I mean, if in a, in a game that doesn't require a lot of props and set pieces, etc., like that, um, you're the you're the face. You're you're not only playing the uh, the non-player characters, but you're also presenting the setting to them in a form of narration. Um, and the words you choose in your narration are going to be pretty important too. Uh, and I might do a, I've done a video on stuff like that before, and maybe I'll do another one. But like specific adjectives and uh, descriptive formats and the way you deliver your narration uh, also lends itself to the setting. If you're running Call of Cthulhu, you should be describing things. You should be more uh, aware of the darker plotting and sort of uh, imminent doom atmosphere that's taking over. Uh, if you're running like an old West game, then you know you can use you can either talk like this or you can word let use words the way they used to do. You know, back in the doggy, we doggy, hold your horses there, boy. Well, I don't know, Mrs. Stratford. I'll find out for sure. Um, so yeah, there's always a, that's like a whole different performance kind of video. But uh, but even when you're narrating, uh, you know, know know the setting, and that that's later on. That's I'm getting ahead of myself. So know your setting. Um, also, as part of getting at, at, organized, and I've, I've kind of touched on. It, so far without saying it, session zero is like a popular term now that's been around for not, I don't know, five to seven years or so. Uh, back in the old days, we just, we didn't really call it that, but we, most of us did a session zero. And that was basically just all uh, the group, the, get, uh, the, play, the dungeon master, the game master and his players getting together, creating characters. Uh, there was a time in my life where I liked people doing it separate. And I still do kind of, only because you can create more, I like, player characters to find out about each other more organically like, instead of like knowing out of like, Oh, I know that person has that ability or that person has high strength or high intelligence, or that person has this weakness or flaw. Uh, and that's fine. Good role players can not role play that, but sometimes it's fun to actually not know, even if you're not going to metagame the knowledge. Um, however, the cool thing about a session zero and which I've now kind of gone back to preferring it somewhat, like, I don't know, I like a little bit of both. Um, of being mysterious, but also a session zero. Session zero is kind of out in the open uh, because the game master discusses with his players, like, here's my idea for a campaign or a storyline. What do you guys think? And let people bounce it back and forth. And that way your players are already, they're involved. Um, they have a buy-in. I like using that term because buy-in is very important in tabletop role-playing game. So they have to buy into your setting, your idea. Um, and then you have to kind of buy in and return to their characters. Now, it should be if you're both buying in correctly, then you're going to meet precisely in the middle, or maybe not precisely, but very close. Meaning that, so if they're buying into, hey, that sounds really cool. We're going to run an old west setting where we're all playing Native Americans. So now they know that they need to make Native American uh, characters, at least. Uh, but I mean, all sorts of probably different types within that that genre, within that um, one 
particular style, uh, but at least they now know. And so, and now you have to have the buy-in to go, okay, so you created a Native American scout, you created a shaman, you created a, 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 man, a Dances with wolf, Wolves type character that he went and lived with the, the white man or the or the Mexicans or whatever for a while. And now they're, they're almost sort of a mixed blood or mixed culture. So yeah. Um, same way you're bringing it back to fantasy. Hey guys, I just want everyone to play dwarves. Um, so, okay, cool. Um, do you want to narrow it down more than that? Is it just dwarven warriors or clerics only? Is it dwarven wizards or sorcerers or weird that is, uh, or is it, you know, so hopefully you don't, uh, and my advice to that is don't narrow down your, vision as a game master don't narrow it down too much like have a general idea yeah I, i'm gonna i want to run this campaign in dark sun or i'm gonna create my own sword and sorcery sort of setting or uh this setting is going to be more like uh john carter-esque where there is kind of like uh science fantasy um but you know don't I, in my opinion don't narrow it down too much uh like the 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 situation I just gave where we're all going to be dwarven wizards, uh, because then you've narrowed it down really narrow and, uh, ensure people can punch out different personality types within those, but that's still, it's really narrow. And, uh, so yeah, don't do that to yourself or to your players. So session zero will allow you to hash all of that out. Here's kind of what I think the campaign will be cool. The players can respond go, yeah, that's really cool. How about this? Or, yeah, I'm not really feeling that. I don't know if I really want to play that kind of campaign, uh, or better yet, yeah, it's kind of cool. I'm not really feeling it, but I would feel it if, how about this? And then the, and you just, you know, typical human interaction, face-to-face -face negotiations, diplomacy, um, and come up with the way. Um, now speaking as a game master who I, I like, obviously I like the collaborative stuff, which is what I just said. I want the players to be happy, but I, I'm typically pretty firm and, and that my player uh, character friends who are awesome. They trust me with that. And that's another thing. You have to have trust. So they trust that, okay, Mike really wants to do, he's got this kind of setting and we know that we can't really do this kind of weird stuff in that setting because it's pretty strictly, you know, he's going to run it pretty strictly like this um, because his setting is very detailed or very, you know, he likes to run it kind of realistically or groundedly, whatever the case is. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, so is the game master be willing to adjust to what your players want, but at the same time, be firm. Don't, don't be like, hey, guys, I want to do a Lord of the Rings kind of um, against the shadow setting. And then suddenly every player t tears it down and, and you end up saying, well, apparently I'm running a science fiction game. Uh, if that's how it really went and you really f feel fine doing that, then go for it. But if you really feel kind of disrespected that they didn't want it, that they completely tore it down, then maybe, you know, maybe consider looking for a couple more players if you really want to stick to that kind of campaign. I apologize for the background because suddenly I decide to videotape and there's like mowing in the background. And so if you guys hear that, I apologize. Um, I may just have to do this over, but if not, I'll just keep going. So session zero, man, it's really loud. I apologize. Um, number two, so know the rule system. Know the rule system. So that means, uh, I'll break it down for you. Uh, it sounds obvious, right? But read the books. Read the books. There's a lot of lore on YouTube, and a lot of it's very wise and smart about just making a rules call and just be loosey-goosey and do whatever. And that's cool, but that what they mean by that most of the time, I think, is that read the books first. Read the rule book. Read the book. Learn the rule system. Don't bother trying to run it is a game master if you're not going to bother really running the rules and you're just going to wing it. Uh, if you want to run something very loosey-goosey and wing it, then then select a game system that's more loosey-goosey, such as like Fate, uh, the Fate uh, rule system or, or something more like that. Um, and that's a cool system if that's what you want to do. Uh, but if you're looking at sort of more uh, a hard-coded game system like Dungeons and Dragons typically is D&D &D 5 edition is a little, a little looser, which what makes it cool. Uh, Savage Kingdoms can be, that's my game, that can be pretty strictish, but there's still a lot of room. To, I mean, there's a lot of room in any game system, honestly, to be a little loosey-goosey, but still no, read the books, read the rules, and get as much into your head that way, because a lot of it, what the videos I think are trying to say is that when you're in the middle of a game session, uh, just make a call. Uh, my, my sort of rule of thumb is is uh, if you can't find it in the core rule book or whatever book it is that you're within 10 seconds, then just 
that slows the game down too, too much, particularly in combat or another scene where it's like, you know, I like to be, I like to be visceral and I kind of like to be in the moment. I want the players to kind of almost be in the moment as much as their characters would be. Um, so yeah, that's my rule of thumb. You can't find it in 10 seconds. Don't then make a call. And then you can go back later and see what the actual rule was. And you'll see that probably 75% of the time you were actually right or really darn close. Like, uh, yeah, I thought that would grant advantage. That's not actually correct, but it does say that you get a plus two bonus out of it or whatever. So you were pretty close. You had, the, you had the right instinct, meaning that you probably read it at some point or you're a good enough game master and familiar enough with the system that you made, you kind of knew what the general call would be. So yeah, read the books, but make the during the game session, which I know uh, this video is not technically about, uh, make the call and then go back later and look. And if it's something that you, if something you ruled on that really screwed over a player character, um, you can always fix it, fix it. Uh, you can all, the, what I, what I like to do by fixing things is like making it organic. So in the next session, story-wise, make something happen that kind of brings it into the fold. Now, if it's something really major, then you may have to like completely say, well, sorry guys, that, that actually never happened. That was a dream sequence or whatever. Uh, the old, uh, the old sitcom way of explaining things. Um, yeah, so read the books, uh, learn the rules as much as you can. Um, only make house rules. Okay, yeah, that's this is number two. This is another thing a lot of uh, sort of new game masters sometimes tend to do. Only make house rules when familiar, meaning that uh, that's what I wrote. Uh, meaning when familiar with the actual rule system. So there's an old saying saying uh, rules are meant to be bro broken, and what that really means that if you actually do the deeper research of what that means it means once you know the rules once you know the laws then you can break them or bend them meaning that you now know the you know you know what you know know what's here you now know what's here and you have now you can figure out where all that in between ground is so yeah that's my advice make house rules only when familiar so really be familiar with the rules before you start going yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna. I think I don't think that a lot that should have disadvantage on it. Or I, I that spell's kind of weird. I think I need to tweak that. Or that class ability, class feature is kind of goofy. Let's. I, I'm gonna fix it. And that's fine. There's a lot of things to be fixed. I, I house rule a lot too. Uh, when I've converted uh, Savage Kingdoms, or I'm currently doing that, uh, working on the D and D version of it. Um, I've had in order to make it still feel like the Savage Kingdom setting, you have to do a fair amount of house rules. But just but be careful with that. Don't break. So I've been careful not to break the core system. Just layer different things on there and change like sort of minor secondary things. Don't, don't I, my advice is don't change the heart, the engine of the game. Because then you're not really running the game anymore. Just find another game system or create your own, which is what I do. Um, so yeah, only make house rules when familiar. Make sure you know everything first before you, make sure you know the rules and the laws before you break them. So yeah, number three, know your setting. Know your setting. Again, sounds uh, so it's kind of mirrors number two. So number two was know the rules. Number three is know your setting. So know the setting uh, that you're running. And that means to read the books, materials, go on the internet. Uh, I kind of gave an example earlier on. If it's uh, um, Forgotten Realms, then read up on Forgotten Realms. Don't be like, oh, I'm just going to, we're going to set it there. But I don't really, I don't really know anything about it. It's like, well, then yeah, why? Just if you don't want to bother, make your own setting or run something that's, that's completely that's you know more generic or something. Uh, although Forgotten Realms is kind of generic, but what I mean is that um, yeah, there's some well-known NPCs and and parts of the setting that are really well known. So if you don't want to have to deal with that, then then don't. So make sure you uh, read up on it and become familiar. Um, Number two to that, or B, I suppose. Create content only when familiar. So it kind of mirrors, again, uh, make house rules only when familiar. So with number three, know your setting. Uh, add additional content or change content only when familiar. So become familiar, again, with the setting first. Uh, and then you can rightly go back and go, nah, that's, yeah, I don't want El Minister muddling around in my campaign version of Forgotten Realms. Or I don't, you know, I think this would suit better for what I have in mind. Uh, but don't do that until you know, because A, it shows a little more respect to the original author or authors, but B, why change something we don't know it? You might, uh, I've seen this before. I've seen people going back to the rules. People go, hey man, I, I'm house ruling that. Here's my house rule. And I'm like, and then you look at it and you're like, well, that's the actual rule. And they're like, oh, I didn't even know. I'm like, well, 
Why didn't you read the rules first? I've literally seen that several times where somebody thought it was a house rule and it was literally the actual rule because I guess they didn't bother reading it, uh, which I guess good call overall, but it was just kind of sort of odd. So create content only. So add additional content to the setting only when you're familiar. Um, and a caveat to that or an addendum to that is that if you're creating content to publish and make money off of, then, you know, obviously make sure who the copyright holder is. Uh, so you don't get in trouble. Um, and, and ask them permission, and uh, you never know. They might say that's cool, or they might say, like, hey, uh, you have to sign a licensing contract, and we get 50% of the whatever it is. So if you're creating content professionally to make money, then obviously you need to check the copyright holder if it's a well-known, uh, such as Middle Earth, obviously, or, or even or Forgotten Realms, like we said, or Greyhawk, or whatever. Number four, know your audience. Know your audience. All right, so let me break that down here. Well, who is your audience? So in tabletop role-playing, as a game master, your audience is obviously the players. That's the first obvious. They are the the actors. They are the lead uh, uh, principal role uh, actors, as well as the audience uh, in traditional tabletop role-playing. Because right? it's just the four or five, six of you sitting around telling a collective story. So your audience primarily is the players. And by knowing them, kind of goes back to session zero. So it's assumed that most of your players are probably friends, people you already know, but that's not always the case, particularly nowadays. Um, when you have online gaming, someone comes on a Roll20 that you've never even met before. It's just an email. Hey, I'd like to join your game. I heard you need a new player. Cool. And next thing you know, you guys are Zooming or Discording together or roll 20 together or all of those. And uh, you've never actually met the person before. But hopefully you got to know each other through emails or whatever, you know, or Discord talking or something. So, but know your players. But most of your players are going to be people you probably already actually know, like in the traditional sense of the word, like face-to-face, -face, you've interacted before. Or maybe you've had a beer or two or whatever. Um, so know your players, and along with that, kind of know like what what things they enjoy. Do they uh, does this guy likes combat a lot? This this uh, lady likes puzzles a lot. Um, this person over here likes um, mystery a lot and mystical and magical things. And, uh, the person over here is like likes diplomacy or social interaction. Um, and that way, if you know your players, you kind of know what. Um, what types of encounters or scenes to run primarily in your campaign. But don't forget about yourself. Some game masters forget. It's like, oh, I'm a, I have got to do this for this guy and this for this girl and this magic item should go to that person. And it's like, well, that's great, but just know that's not always going to happen. And also know that you need to take care of yourself. So if there's a couple scene type of things you like to have in games, then by golly, you had all your rights to do it. Uh, chances are a lot of your players will like it. It's really rare that something you choose, uh, you like as a GM, nobody in your uh, group doesn't like. That'd be really rare. Uh, so make sure you take care of yourself, but primarily your players. Um, know your audience, right? So the second part of an audience would be the viewer. So if you're streaming online, you're running a, a stream, because that's a, kind of a thing. That's a big thing nowadays. Hopefully I'll eventually get into it some. Mr. Lack of Technology here. Um, so you can, uh, you know, streaming games uh, is like a, a big thing now on Twitch channel or wherever, or even just Google Hangouts or something. Um, so at that point, the audience becomes bigger than the players. The audience becomes the viewers, right? Uh, so know them as well. Know uh, what do you think uh, most of the audience would like. Um, the artist approach to that, uh, the artistic approach to that is that, you know, the old school saying that uh, as an artist, you should create what you like. Uh, and not worry so much about because you will gain an audience. Like I just said, it's very rare that an artist or a game master or whatever does something that others don't like. At least some others don't like. At least 30%, 50%. So, so yes, do do your own thing, but you know, sort of be mindful if you're if you're streaming at uh, 8 p.m. on a Wednesday night. You know. No, that might be more of a family time. If you're streaming at uh, 11 a.m. Saturday, you might could be a little more dark and risque or something. Uh, and make sure you put PG-13 or something on there or whatever. Um, you'll probably be dinged if you don't, but so to save yourself that agony, do so. Know thy audience. And the last part to know your audience is know thyself. Know thyself. Meaning... That you have to know, sort of already touched on it, but know what you also enjoy. You have to take care of you as well as the game master. If the game master is not happy and engaged, then certainly the players aren't going to be speaking as a stage actor. And seeing people on stage, 
sometimes you can tell when I'm like that actor's completely dialed out or uh, he's tired, he's got something else on his mind. Um, most people can go beyond that and, and put all the real world stuff aside, but we're all human and sometimes it shows. So if you're going to be running a three, four hour session, five hour, maybe um, you got to be enjoying what you're doing. So know thyself, know, know that you're, uh, and also know that you're capable. I'm capable, I think, of running a Twitch channel show every Tuesday night for four hours, uh, this style of gaming uh, and these rules. So uh, it sounds like a lot, but it, it kind of is, as a game, as game master uh, or dungeon master or whatever, uh, narrator. You, you, uh, it's a little bit of responsibility. It's a, it's a, it's a little, you know, it's, we all agree. I mean, the player characters are important, obviously, but the game masters kind of got a lot more going on. So just know that. All right. Number five, the final one, general campaign concept. So what style of game do you want to run? And again, this can come out in session zero, unless the game master already has something in mind, and then you would just pitch it to the players at session zero. So what does that actually mean? So there's really three types of uh, tabletop stories. And one, one is really kind of a subtype of the other. There's one shots, episod episodic, and campaign. Those are really your kind of thin three general types and you can break them down in different ways if you want. But so a one shot and well, this term gets used all the time is literally you're going to play one session of probably this specialized game um, or in a special setting or, or there's a special theme uh, behind it usually is how, why it's a one shot or it's a, you're at a convention, not going to probably see most of these people again. They've got a four hour slot they paid for or whatever. And this is the adventure and it happens in four hours. Probably not going to continue on, although sometimes that's happened. Uh, then there's episodic. Episodic means that you're probably going to, maybe you are going to meet once per week or, or whatever, once every couple of weeks, whatever time allotment you have. Um, but you're going to run it. So I've heard people describe it as uh, Star Trek. I actually prefer to, uh, prefer to describe it as uh, Conan uh, to use more of a fantasy trope. Meaning, so, meaning that Star Trek was more op uh, episodic. There might have been some overall, uh, overall story arcs. But usually it was like adventure to adventure. You know, it was like scenario to scenario. Uh, a better example, in my opinion, is the Conan book. So if you look at the original Robert E. Howard Conan stories, Conan, uh, Conan the Sumerian, or Conan the, the Barbarian, um, his, all of his stories, uh, they're rarely, actually, they're really never, uh, maybe very loosely connected. So you read one story and Conan's 17 years old and he's uh, just left Samaria and he's trying to rob this. He's kind of living, making a life as a thief and a mercenary. And he's trying to rob, rob this tower known as the Tower of the Elephant to find this great jewel or whatever. And then the next story is, you know, is suddenly he's like, it may not even say, but you get to, you get the feeling that this is like eight to ten years later. He's now in his mid to late twenties, and he's uh, leading a mercenary group. And he's, he's suddenly in the last adventure, he was just wearing a loincloth, and now he's got this cool suit of, of mail on, chainmail, and uh, shield over his back, and he's got a cool sword as well as his axe or whatever. Uh, the next story, he's back to a loincloth, and he's carrying a scimitar mainly instead of like a, a broadsword. Um, so that's episodic meaning. So meaning that, uh, and you can do the, to put that to D and D or savage kingdoms or whatever tabletop role-playing terms. That means you're, you play a session and then the next session. And again, make sure the players know it's at the session zero meeting or whatever that six months later, this is where you guys are six months later. Um, and the cool thing about that is you can do, if you're playing a system that has downtime, in it, like Dungeons and Dragons, Savage Kingdoms, it gives the players some cool little things they could be doing during the six months or a year that they're uh, between episodes. Um, or you can just literally do it like the old uh, Conan. I really like the Conan tabletop game from Mongoose Publishing. By far the best D20 version of, uh, of really, well, of any thing, actually. Um, uh, and it just didn't really worry about it was like literally you could be you could actually run a uh, when i ran it I actually ran more of a traditional campaign like uh but it it said you know feel free to be like the actual stories and okay guys three months later you're now in the pictish wildernesses uh, wilderness wilderness uh, or seven months later you're in stygia or whatever um so that's episodic so the last thing probably the main one that most people enjoy and this is kind of my bread, bread and butter as well and that's the campaign 
Um, that was a campaign. That's a military title. It goes all the way back to Chainmail and early D&D from Gary Gygax. And the reason that uh, terminology was chosen is because a lot of you know, early D&D was based on uh, medieval combat. Uh, and then, you know, as you might know, Dave Arneson's the one who suggested, hey, why don't we you play individual characters, you know, the, the commanders, and they see what they do. They go on adventures or whatever. So that's kind of where that came from, as you probably know. So that's the campaign. That's why it's called, it has a military term. Um, I guess another term you could use is like a grand narrative or grand scope narrative or whatever. But most people just say campaign because it works. It's a easy word, two syllables. Everybody knows what it means for the most part in the gaming community. And so that means you're running an on, uh, ongoing uh, campaign. So it's, it's episodic in the sense that every session, I guess, is an episode, but it picks up where you left off, which is what I like. And that's why I like, I try to end session. People that know me as a game master, I try to end sessions at a cliffhanger, uh, almost like watching episodic TV where uh, it either ends on an up note or a down note, not a middle note. So an up note meaning it's the cliffhanger. It's like, you know, you recently literally hanging off of a cliff and then it fades to black in the credits roll or uh, a character walks in the background and, and says, son, I haven't seen you for years. And then, uh, or the down note, which is where you, they, they're all this stuff happen and you get to a place of rest and then cut and like the fade, the fade to black literally represents probably going to sleep nighttime or something like that. That's a downbeat. Anyway, that's a whole different thing. So that's how a campaign uh, thing works. It's like every a session just links to the other. So if you left session one off with them, with the, them as the player characters, the adventurers, uh, being nice, cozy in an inn around a fire, around an inn you know, after they went through a herring uh, encounter, then the next time you pick up, it's you're still around the fire. Now you could kind of go in between episodic and campaign, which I've done a few times, where it's like, okay, you guys, let, but this is uh, it's now the next morning. Eight, eight or nine hours have passed, so it's like so that way you're not you don't pick up on a downbeat and start in a downbeat. So that way, if you end in a downbeat, like I said, like around the fire, comfy, nothing much happening, then when you pick up eight hours later, it's more of an upbeat pickup. So anyway, it's just a storytelling thing. Um, so the last thing with the general campaign concept is uh, decide as a game master where you, whether you have a possible end game in mind, like you have a grand story in mind. Um, and I would say to do that, but leave plenty of room for improv because as, as we all know, you may have this grand like eventual concept in mind, but the player characters may not ever get to that. And that's fine. Don't, uh, don't railroad them that way. You, you can railroad in the sense of being in game about it, like uh, having them discover lots of rumors, uh, but without beating them over the head because it will become funny and a joke. And some people and some players will literally resist the fact that you're, you're trying to get them to do a certain thing uh, because they feel like it's, it's a trap maybe, or they're just being silly with you and they're just, you know, they're, they're just kind of jerking your train a little train chain a little bit. So, um, so yeah, so my advice is to have a possible, um, what I try to do is I have about three things in mind. Uh, grand overall, yeah, so the the rise of Azrakoth is called this recent cult in Savage Kingdoms that this uh, uh, angel had fallen had fallen back to a, an angelic lord who had fallen back to his demonic base status and had found a portal into the mortal realm and had come leading this army through and he started this cult and was marking people with this symbol and then promised them eternal life which wasn't you know a typical demon wasn't really true it's like they you could die once and then they would come back as a zombie so in a way it was eternal life but it wasn't um so uh and that was a possibility and there was another possibility of an, uh the two kings in his mondos uh storyline they might even got involved with one of the kings trying to overthrow the current king and there was like another third so what i try to have in mind is like if i'm trying to do uh have like three maybe even four grand story arcs in mind and then let the player characters kind of choose organically by whatever uh rumors they might hear which i know is is a lot on you to give the rumors uh but let them ask around let them in character if they if they do hear a rumor about azra Kothley and one one or two characters will inevitably because of their character background might go oh that's uh, my character's that's very interesting i'm going to go find out i'm going to go to the local temple library and try to research more i'm going to go into the streets and maybe gather information so that will cue them into doing organic uh, storytelling choices so just have a you know somebody again 
So in a nutshell, my advice is to maybe have an end game or two uh, major story arc, uh, but leave plenty of room for improv. And if they don't get to that, and everybody's having a great time in the setting, then then you've won. It doesn't it doesn't matter. In fact, in my experience, where <laughs> the uh, once they got on the, the sort of the main thing I had in mind, it was not actually nearly as fun as when they were just kind of messing around with minor storylines and kind of doing their own thing. So just know the grand arcing thing is not necessarily better than the minor secondary adventures or sidetracks. Sometimes those are far more interesting. So, all right, I think I'll leave it at that at 35 minutes. Uh, that's my top five GM prep tips, even before the first die is cast. I may follow up on this video in the next day or two, and I will give you my top five uh, GM tips uh, once the game is going, once the dice are cast. Dice are cast. Right. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. If you made it this far, uh, share this video, subscribe, um, blah, 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 all that stuff all those YouTube guys say. Um, and stay safe and stay sane, and I'll talk to you later.